Hi there. So today I'm going to talk about the Renaissance. Uh, not so much about the music of the Renaissance, I don't think. I don't think I'll be able to get to that in this lecture. This is more about the historical background and about the phenomenon of the Renaissance itself. And so I'm just sort of taking as my point of departure pages 64 and 65 and a little bit over into 66 where they have this very famous painting, The School of Athens by Raphael. Uh, that's 64, 65, and 66 in the Camian Ninth Brief Edition of Music and, Appre and Appreciation. And um, I would actually like you to go back and read those pages again. I've, I've already assigned them, because remember how the book works. Uh, we get the cultural historical background to the Middle Ages. Then we get the cultural historical background to the Renaissance. And then we get into the music of the Middle Ages, which we've just finished. And then we get the music of the Renaissance. But the problem is we really need to go back, I think, and, and revisit that um, cultural, historical background to the Renaissance before we get to talking about the Renaissance. And uh, let's just start with uh, the book's first sentence here, first couple of sentences. The 15th and 16th centuries in Europe have come to be known as the Renaissance. People then spoke of a rebirth. That's what the word literally means. The naissance. It's, it's actually a French word. Um, the naissance part of it. But the root is the same root as you'd see in nativity. Like a nativity scene is a scene of the birth of Christ. Um, if you are a native of some place. It means you were born there. There's lots of words you can think of. A, a, a neonatal unit at a hospital. The neo means new. Natal means has to do with being born. The newborn unit. The neonatal. Um, so the word literally means rebirth. Uh, people then spoke of a rebirth or renaissance of human creativity. Now that's a little bit misleading. Uh, because it is not the case that there was no human creativity in the Middle Ages. That's not really the thing that was reborn. Not exactly. There was an awful lot of creativity in the Renaissance, but there was in the Middle Ages too. So, uh, it's a little bit misleading. Um, again, I, I like to sometimes uh, take issue with the book's uh, take on things. But there was something that was reborn for sure, but it wasn't really human creativity. We'll find out what it is. It says here, it was a period of exploration and adventure. Consider the voyages of Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, and Ferdinand Magellan, among many others. That's certainly true. It was a period of exploration and adventure. And there's a reason why we have this sudden period of exploration and adventure, which, where we, which we didn't see an awful lot of before. There's a specific reason why, which I'll get to. The Renaissance was an age of curiosity and individualism, too, as can be seen in the remarkable life of Leonardo da Vinci. Um, certainly, it was an age of curiosity and individualism, but the question might, again, be, well, why was the Renaissance an age of curiosity and individualism, and the Middle Ages really wasn't? Um, I think it's fair to say that the Middle Ages was many things, but it was not an era that's really known for its uh, curiosity and individualism. In fact, the opposite of those things uh, was more stressed during the Middle Ages, because curiosity is something that can lead you astray. And remember, if we're talking about the Middle Ages, we're talking about a term, time when the, the, the church... Catholic Church was the sort of supreme authority, the most powerful institution, and uh, they didn't want you being either curious or individualistic. Those are things that the Catholic Church frowned on. They sort of saw as sort of part, maybe part of the sin of pride, certainly, individualism. You shouldn't think of yourself as an individual and as being particularly special. Right? That's a, That was the... the uh, medieval mindset. And you shouldn't be overly curious either, because we, the clergy, will tell you what's what. 
You shouldn't trouble your little head uh, thinking too hard about things. That's our job. We have been trained. You haven't. We will tell you what you should do and how you should think, etc. Okay, so we'll get to why the Renaissance is an area of, of curiosity and individualism, whereas the Middle Ages wasn't. Um, Oh, and we're getting to it right now. Next page. During the Renaissance, the dominant intellectual movement, which was called humanism, focused on human life and its accomplishments. Now, this next sentence is definitely problematic. It says here, humanists were not concerned with an afterlife in heaven or hell. That's not true. Humanists, the, the, the humanists of the Renaissance were still devout Christians. They believed in heaven and hell. It's just that they believed that there was more to life than worrying about heaven and hell or being solely focused on heaven and hell. Instead, humanists believed that things of this world, that this life here on earth was also worth being curious about, worth exploring, worth learning about, worth enjoying, worth depicting realistically in the arts. There's a reason why uh, the visual arts, for example, and sculpture become so much more realistic in the Renaissance than in the Middle Ages. It's not just that, that Renaissance uh, artists had better technique. Um, it's that in the Renaissance it was considered important to really get it naturalistic and right, to imitate nature. It was not considered as important in the Middle Ages for reasons that we will get to. Lots of reasons that I still have to get to, but um, in part that, that, because that's a reflection of things of this world. You know, to make to take the trouble to make, let's say, uh, a tree in the background of a Renaissance painting. To go to the trouble to make that an actually a realistic tree, like a a real oak tree or a poplar tree with the leaves that look like an oak tree or a poplar tree or whatever, rather than just sort of some generic cartoonish tree that represents a tree, as you might see in the Middle Ages. It's not important what kind of tree it is. It's got a branch, it's got a trunk and branches and leaves on it. It's a tree. It stands for a tree. It's a symbolic tree. It's not important that it be realistic. In a sense, uh, Part of the reason that Middle Ages art is sort of cartoonish, meaning it's not terribly realistic, uh, it's more symbolic. This thing represents a tree, and you understand that it's a tree. It's not important that it be that realistic. It's art that's created for a, a mostly illiterate culture, right? Where uh, pictures represent things and symbolize things, and it's not important that they be terribly realistic. The thing in itself is not really important, it's what it represents. But for the Renaissance artist, it's important to get that thing right, to really make it look natural and convincing and realistic. Um, anyway, humanists... This, this sentence, I, I, I disagree with. Humanists were not concerned with an afterlife in heaven or hell. That's not true. This part is true, however. Though devout Christians, they were captivated by the cultures of ancient Greece and Rome. So these are the, these are the two important aspects of humanism, which again is the dominant intellectual movement of the Renaissance. It's kind of like the, the intellectual fuel for the Renaissance is this new humanistic attitude. The humanistic attitude basically has two parts. Part one I've already talked about, the idea that human life, life here on this earth, the time we are given, is important, is precious. It's not just something to try and get through it's the medieval attitude that you just kind of have to get through it and suffer through it and hopefully keep your soul as clean as possible so that you can get into heaven and not into hell. That's the medieval attitude. The Renaissance attitude is no, there's more to life than that. And not only that, human beings, this is part of the humanist idea, human beings have individual worth and dignity. Every human being has individual worth and dignity. 
That's an idea that is not uh, naturally found in the Middle Ages. Human life was cheap and kind of disposable in the Middle Ages. The idea that every human being had, had dignity and worth. Uh, maybe the life of a king or a bishop had great dignity and worth, but the average peasant, the average illiterate peasant toiling in the mud, uh, they're basically disposable people. Right? That was the attitude of, let's say, educated people, powerful people in the Middle Ages. But that attitude begins to shift, and it's, it's hard to point to any single thing. But remember I talked about how the end of the Middle Ages, in a sense, uh, the, the, let's say the 14th century to a great extent, and, and to an extent, you know, centuries before that, but certainly the 14th century was sort of laying the groundwork for the Renaissance. Because what did we see? We, we saw in the 14th century, the 1300s, this awful plague wiping out one-third of the population of Europe. And that changes people, you know. Um, we saw certainly an undermining of the people's faith, not in God, but in the church. Because the church goes through this, this crisis and this split, the Western schism. The leadership of the church is, uh, is sort of scorned and mocked. Sort of like the, the same way that we look at politicians today. You could be... Uh, if, let's say today, especially in this you know election season and all that, and I'm not going to get political, but um, imagine that you are an average American, and you certainly believe in the idea of America. You consider yourself, you know, you, you think America is a great country. Uh, you believe in the ideals of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and all of that. But as far as politicians go. To hell with all of them, right? Republicans and Democrats and all the squabbling and fighting. You know, politicians as a class, the people who are who swear an oath to the Constitution and are supposed to uphold, you know, the values of the Constitution, are supposed to be, you know, our leaders, people are very disillusioned with politicians. It's sort of like that's the way people felt about the church. In the late Middle Ages. So the church is weakened and discredited. And who's ready to take advantage of that and to step in and fill that power vacuum that is being left by the weakening of the church? The nobility, right? And so we see an emphasis on more secular values as the nobility become more powerful. So what we see in the Renaissance is if this line sort of represents the power and influence of the church, it's on the decline. It's still powerful. The church is still powerful during the Renaissance, but it's not as powerful as it once was. And instead, the power of the nobility is on the increase. Okay, And this trend will increase, uh, and especially the upper crust of the nobility, the, the kings and queens and emperors of Europe, their power is, is going to reach its peak in the next era that we get to. In the, in the Baroque era. But for now, we're in the Renaissance. And so I've, I've, I've focused on one aspect of this thing we call humanism. The idea that human life, things of this world, are worthwhile. Uh, and life here on Earth is not just something to be gotten through on your way to the next world. Um, and the idea that human beings have individual worth and dignity and all that. The other important aspect of humanism is what's stated here. This fascination with the cultures of ancient Greece and Rome. Right? A humanist, what that term implies, a, a, a humanist from the Renaissance is someone who looks back to the time before the Middle Ages to the, the cultures of ancient Greece and Rome the, the classical civilizations, and says, those were the good old days. That was when giants walked the earth. The great, uh, the, the great historical figures of classical antiquity. Those are the people we should idolize and look up to. Right? And if we can hopefully, uh, if we can 
achieve what they achieved and maybe even go beyond it. That's the best we could possibly hope for. They are, they have set a model for us and a standard for us to rise to and to hopefully maybe even exceed, right? That was the attitude at the beginning of the Renaissance. And it is true, as the book says, that people during that time really did, that is, let's, let's say, educated people, still a very small minority of society, but getting a little bit bigger because, again, remember, the nobility now is, is uh, it, it considers education to be definitely a thing of value, not like in the, in the earlier Middle Ages where the nobility were the warrior class and really had no use for literacy or education because they were just a bunch of warlords, basically. We get to the later Middle Ages and the nobility start to see the value in education and, and it creates a demand, for example, for universities. Universities begin appearing in the late 1100s and quickly spread throughout Europe. So over a period of centuries, we've been laying the groundwork for a literate, educated, noble class, right? So now we have, we have two educated classes of society, the clergy and the nobility, right? The vast majority of people still illiterate in Europe, but we've got, you know, at least twice as many educated people or literate people than we had before, right? Um, and... So, uh, when you think of the Renaissance, you might think primarily of the visual arts. You might think of painters and sculptors. You might think of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and maybe Raphael and a few others. But, uh, and certainly, there are tremendous achievements in the visual arts. But the Renaissance is not something that's just about art. Right? It's a cultural movement. It's a new attitude among the educated people that is eventually going to trickle down uh, maybe to the less educated people, to the what we might today call the middle class people. But it begins with the educated people. Um, and it really begins more with literature than with the visual arts. Um, the... the the guy who came up with this, this sort of framework that we have ancient history and then we have this middle age, which is something to be disdained and scorned, uh, right? And now we have a renaissance, a rebirth of the values, of the attitude, of the spirit of antiquity, of the ancient Greeks and Romans, which was lost, which was suppressed by the church during the Middle Ages, in part because of the associations with paganism, but also this, these associations with things that the church saw as negative, like individuality, curiosity, the idea that every human being has individual dignity, it's all, all this kind of stuff. The ideas that the church, uh, the Catholic church in their Middle Ages uh, was, did not encourage. The guy who kind of came up with that uh, system, that framework of ancient, medieval, and now a renaissance, was a poet uh, named Petrarch. Um, and uh, it was really with, uh, with literature that the renaissance began, because what happened was that, it was that poets like Petrarch, writers especially, and let's say uh, educated nobility, began taking an interest in Latin, in good Latin. You know, Latin, of course, had still been uh, spoken within the church, but it be kind of was not the true, pure, classical Latin of, let's say, you know, Cicero or Cato the Elder or whatever. And also Greek, because they wanted to, first of all, they wanted to read, as, as they wanted to find as much as possible the works of ancient Greek and Latin poets in their own language, not just in some translation that had been, you know, uh, that had been translated many times throughout many different languages by people who maybe didn't even really know what they were translating, by monks who were just copying down by... No, we want to get to the original source. We want to find as much ancient Greek and Latin history, poetry, drama, or whatever, as we can find. And so they actually, uh, some of these 
uh, sort of uh, poets or scholars or uh, members of the nobility who were, who were humanists, who were into this kind of thing. They sent people out to the libraries and monasteries throughout Europe in search of anything that was in Greek or in Latin. And along the way, they discovered not just literature, poetry, whatever. They discovered scientific works, mathematical works, works on uh, philosophy, and, uh, and, and all kinds of things that had, in essence, sort of lain dormant, had been forgotten. Another important source of, of material from the ancient Greek and Roman world, which had been kind of sealed off and unavailable for a long time, was uh, came from Constantinople. Now remember, that date of 1450, right, which marks the beginning of the Renaissance, and I talked about the problems with that date, that really it's not that anything particular happened in 1450. It's that a lot of things were building up to uh, a, a, a time when, you know, whichever year you decide to point to, certainly 1453 was an important year because that's when the city of Constantinople, the capital of the old Eastern Roman Empire, was finally taken by the Turks, by the Ottoman Turks, and made their new capital. In the lead up to the fall of Constantinople, uh, the, a lot of the educated, wealthier people from Constantinople, Constantinople sought to get out. They saw what was coming. They knew that eventually the city would be taken. It had been surrounded by Turkish territory for a very long time. And some of the wealthier, well-to-do people of Constantinople wanted to get out. And they did get out, many of them, and they resettled in Italy, and they brought their cultural treasures with them. Their paintings, their books, their statues, their whatever, right? Remember, Constantinople was the last little bit of the, the old Roman Empire which was left, and it was actually more Greek in culture than, than Roman. So it is sort of an ideal mix of the two cultures. So this exodus from Constantinople, uh, in part also fueled this, uh, this, this desire for old texts, old artifacts, old artworks, whatever, from the ancient world. Um, by the way, the, the, uh, the taking of Constantinople also was the event which more than any other spurred on the Age of Discovery and led to the voyages of Columbus, Magellan, others. Because Constantinople, if you look at it today on a map, if you look at Istanbul, and maybe I'll put a, a link up in D2L, uh, the, the city is today called Istanbul. Back then it was called Constantinople. Um, but it is situated at, at a strategic uh, choke point between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's maybe the most strategic location in the entire world. It's right there actually in, in the, uh, it's a city which exists on two continents today. There's a, the Asian side and the European side. And it's in the, one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world today. You cannot pass through that narrow shipping lane. You cannot get from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea without going past Constantinople. Why is that so important? Well, that's where all of the trade from the East came from. All of the luxury goods, the silks and spices, and things that you couldn't get in Europe, things that came from China or from India, all had to pass through Constantinople. Right? And that's one of the reasons why that city was there, because it was such an important strategic location. Well, once the Turks had taken that city, and once they controlled basically all of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, that effectively cut off this trade or made it much more expensive. Because if you are going to, if you're going to trade and you're going to, you're going to go through the, the Turks who are Muslim, who are, you know, off and on uh, sworn enemies of the Christian infidels, you know, it's risky business, you know. If you send a ship into those waters and that ship is taken by the Turks, your entire, you know, your, your investment is lost. 
uh, your, the, the crew of your ship are going to be enslaved at best if they're not killed outright, right? So the Turks now hold this crucial choke point. And if you want any of those luxury goods, well, the Turks are going to demand a very high markup. So what are you going to do? If you can no longer go east, I'm not sure if I'm pointing east. Uh, if, you can, if you can no longer go east to get those luxury goods, those silks and spices, because the Turks control the eastern Mediterranean, maybe what you need to do is go west and circumvent them, eliminate the middleman. Sail west across the Atlantic Ocean, and sooner or later you will reach the coast of India or China. And you can set up your own direct trade and cut out the Turks. Right? That's what inspired these voyages of discovery. It's not that Columbus was wanted to discover for its own sake. No. Right? And if he had just wanted to go out and explore for its own sake, he never would have had the financial backing. And it was hard enough for him to find financial backing anyway. But um, the reason he did is because Ferdinand and Isabella saw the potential, at least, to make a huge profit. Because they could set up uh, trade connections with the Indians, with the Chinese. Now, of course, what they didn't realize is that there's this whole other continent or pair of continents in the way. North and South America. The, the Europeans had no idea, really, of North and South America. Of course, the Vikings uh, around in the 1100s did, uh, as you probably know, did make it into Greenland and a little bit into, uh, into Newfoundland. Um, but they didn't establish a permanent, permanent settlement there. Um, and, and so it, the, the Viking voyages to, uh, to North America were, were kind of a footnote. Um, so, Christopher Columbus, and that's the reason we call American Indians Indians, is because when Christopher Columbus arrived at these outlying islands off of uh, Central North America, he assumed that he had discovered maybe some islands off the coast of India, and he assumed that the people he saw there were Indians, so he called them Indians, and it just kind of stuck. To the, now, Christopher Columbus, by the way, made four voyages to the New World, and he never realized that he had discovered a new world. He was, he was convinced to the end of his life that what he discovered was China or India or something. He didn't know that he had discovered this whole new world on which we are today having our class. So... Um, other big changes, by the way, um, relating to the fall of Constantinople. Constantinople was the first big walled city that was taken by cannon, by gunfire. Okay, um, and uh, it, this was a, a game changer. The the development of gunpowder, which really took place in Europe in the late 1300s. Uh, there were a, a couple of battles in the Hundred Years' War, which also ended in 1453, by the way, in the Hundred Years' War, which involved gunpowder. They did have some primitive guns. Uh, and, of course, the Chinese had already invented gunpowder hundreds of years before. But in the West, the first really decisive use of gunpowder, that is, using a big cannon to knock a hole in a walled city, was in 1453. The reason Constantinople was not taken for the previous 1,000, over 1,000 years of its existence is because it was, it was surrounded by water on two sides and by a very stout wall, the Theodosian Walls, which had been built in the late 300s, early 400s by the Roman Emperor Theodosius. Those walls were simply impregnable. There was no way uh, to, to get past them, unless you had cannon, right? And uh, so the, the development of cannon changed warfare, changed the social compact. Because remember, we have this, these classes of society, right? We have the warrior class and the, the uh, priestly class and then the 
class of commoners, of workers. And uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, that, that's why we have, we have castles and walled cities, is because it was, it was very difficult using medieval technology to take a walled city. And very often the way that you would take a walled city was really by trickery, uh, rather than by the use of catapults or ladders or digging underneath, because it was just, uh, you, were, you were in a much stronger position to be inside the castle in, or inside the walled city than to be an attacker. Because, of course, you could put wall, ladders up against the wall and climb, well, they could push your ladders down. They would be shooting arrows down at you while you're trying to shoot up at them. And they're shooting out of these little thin arrow slits and they're standing behind a, you know, maybe a two foot thick stone wall shooting arrows down at you through a slit and you're trying to shoot up at them and trying to what? Get, get your arrow in that tiny slit? Hopeless, right? You can dig underneath the walls of the castle and they can flood those tunnels or they can pour boiling oil down at you. And as long as you are well supplied inside your castle, inside your walled city, you're, you're probably in good shape in the Middle Ages. But the invention of gunpowder and cannon changes all that. And since it changes warfare, it changes society too, inevitably. Right? The idea of this sort of elite warrior class supported by a few hundred archers, um, that's, that's no longer going to be how wars are, are fought anymore. Right? You need mass armies, you need artillery. Right? Uh, so, three different big changes, all kind of revolving around the, around the city of Constantinople. Right? The fact that it was the last little repository of the ancient world, really. It was the last little bit of the old Roman Empire, and it contained still a lot of cultural treasures that were that had been lost or forgotten or suppressed in Europe. And of course, uh, it was this uh, this very strategic point in terms of trade between East and West, and the loss of Constantinople spurred on the age of exploration. That's why no one bothered to try and cross the ocean in the Middle Ages. Uh, and it's not that people thought they were going to fall off the edge of the world. I mean, there were some technological challenges, but the reason was, there was no reason to do that. Why would you bother risking out, you know, sailing out into the Atlantic Ocean? Why would you do that? What, what is the point? What is to be gained from that? You can sail within the Mediterranean and trade, you know, between Africa and Asia and Europe. You've got it all right there in the Mediterranean. Why would you bother sailing out into the open ocean? How are you going to keep enough water in your ship, in your in your ship, enough fresh water, enough food for the crew to even make it when you don't know what's out there? Right? There has to be some some real big possible benefit if you're going to undertake a risk like that. And after the taking of Constantinople, there was a possible benefit. That is hooking up with trade in China and India. And I've already explained that. I won't belabor it too much. But these are several earth-shattering events that are happening around the same time in the 1450s. Now here's another huge earth-shattering event. The invention of printing with movable metal type by Johannes Gutenberg, uh, which took place right around the same time. Uh, Gutenberg printed his first Bible in 1455. And uh, if you go to, let's say, the, the, uh, uh, the National Library, in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., as you walk into the Library of Congress, the very first thing you see in this glass display case is a Gutenberg Bible. Now, of all of the incredible things that happened around this time, the invention of printing with movable metal type was maybe the most important. It was the equivalent back then to the, in, the invention or the development of the internet today. And I, I've been saying that now for, for 20 years that I've been teaching this, uh, this kind of course. And uh, the problem is you guys have grown up with the internet. You, you don't even, you're not even aware of a world without an internet. You've grown up with it, right? It's been in full force your entire lives. But 
let me tell you, take it from me, someone who lived half my life before there was an internet. It's a different world now in many ways, and, and we're really still at just the beginning. Um, very similar kind of thing with the invention of printing, because it, there were a number of things that happened uh, as a direct result of the invention of printing. First of all, the cost of books came way, 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 way down. Because who was making books before the invention of printing? Monks, making them by hand, copying them out by hand in monasteries. And a single book might take months to create, right? and would be, therefore, very expensive, very precious. Only the very rich could afford to have a whole bunch of books, right? And that meant that for people who were not very rich, there was not that much point in learning to read. What is the point of learning to read if you can't afford the cost of a book, right? It's not that people were just stupid and that's why they were illiterate. Like, you should learn to read. Why should I bother? I can't afford the, the cost of a book, right? Uh, but if the cost of books comes way, way down because of this new technology, well, maybe it is worth it for an average Joe, or maybe the children of an average Joe, to uh, be taught how, how to read. Also, think about this. We have this new technology, which brings down the cost of books. So suddenly, books are much, much cheaper. But what are we going to put in the books, right? It's not like there's a whole bunch of material just sitting around or a whole bunch of writers who are just ready to provide material for these books. Well, actually, there, there is now uh, material being discovered, remember, being rediscovered. Uh, a lot of the ancient texts uh, by the Greeks and Romans. So even if you don't have a whole bunch of people ready at that moment to produce original new work to put in these books, you've got the golden oldies. You've got works of classical literature, and not just literature, but uh, like history and poetry and drama, whatever, but you've got mathematical treatises. You've got, let's say, the works of Aristotle, right? Uh, and, and all of these, these uh, works by ancient Greek and Roman philosophers, authors, poets, uh, that is available there to be uh, put into these books. So now that material is, is being distributed. Um, and remember, we've had universities for a while now, right? So we've got an educated, literate class of people, uh, and we have sort of an infrastructure that is that is primed and ready for this invention of the modern book, the printed book. Not only that, we, we, have, this, uh, we have this drive for mass literacy. Right? The Renaissance is where we see the beginning of the idea that, okay, wait, where do you hear this idea? Mind-blowing idea. Everybody should learn to read and write. Everybody should learn to read and write. That's a new idea. That's an idea that we take for granted. Of course everybody should learn to read and write. That's a new idea that comes out of the Renaissance, right? And uh, the people who, who have this idea, everybody should learn to read and write. Everybody should learn to read, especially, right? Are the people saying that, are they just like humanists? Are they just... You know, just, it would be good for people. Well, some of them, yeah, some of them, it's just out of, it, it's a sort of an altruistic thing. It will, it will improve people's lives. It will make them better, richer, they will have richer lives if they can read. Yeah, some, some people certainly believe that. But some people are saying that because they want to make money. Because if we're going to be setting up printing presses, and if we're going to have, let's say, you know, uh, paper mills, if we're going to be creating huge quantities of ink, if we're going to be creating the metal type, the, the metal blocks that go into a printing press, all of this, it takes a lot of work. It takes investment, right? We need to have a return on that investment. In order to have a return on that investment, we should, we should encourage everybody to learn to read so that there will be demand for our product, 
right? Another one of the things that develops during the Renaissance is what we might call capitalism. Capitalism uh, is, is sort of a, a dirty word often today. Uh, I, I see sometimes people protesting with signs and say, down with capitalism. And I think if it were not for capitalism, nobody would be able to read that sign, maybe 5% of the population. Mass literacy is, it was made possible by capitalism. The beautiful art of the, of the Renaissance was made possible by capitalism. You know who paid for a lot of that art? Who were the patrons who paid people like Leonardo and Michelangelo? They were bankers like the Medici family, right? Uh, they were people who made a lot of money and wanted to do something with that money. They didn't want to just hide it in a mattress. They wanted to buy beautiful works of art. And they also wanted to beautify the cities they lived in. And they also wanted to give to charity because they were humanists, because they believed that every human life had dignity and worth. Right? Um, so the, 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 the Renaissance is an endlessly fascinating time. And again, it's not just about, about art. It's about a new attitude, uh, an attitude that I think a lot of us have today and that we might not realize where it comes from. You know, so many of the attitudes that we walk around with, the, the, the ideas that we have, that we take for granted, and, and that we maybe assume, well, that's just natural. Everybody thinks this way. Everybody has always thought this way. No, no, no. There was a time not so long ago. And you might think, well, 550 years is a long time ago. No, not really. It's a blink of an eye. In terms of all of human history, remember, human beings, just like you and me, have been on this planet for at least 250,000 years. And only in the last 500, 600 years have we, in Europe at least, started to, to you know, adopt this idea that every human life has dignity and value. Every human life. Right. Uh, we're going to see as we get into, let's say, the as we get into the Enlightenment, especially, we're going to see more new ideas, which were new then, which are maybe old now, uh, ideas that we take for granted, that we walk around with every day in our heads, assumptions that we have, attitudes that we have. We should know where those came from and what people thought before, what the alternatives are. This is part of the process, I think, of becoming truly educated. Okay, I will get back to the subject of the Renaissance. Um, so where I left off in the book here, page 65, I was talking about though, though the humanists were devout Christians, they were captivated by the cultures of ancient Greece and Rome. And that's the thing that was reborn. The cultural attitude of the ancient Greeks and Romans. Right? For example... Uh, one of the most famous statues of the Renaissance, even from this far away, even on a little screen, you will recognize Michelangelo's David, right? uh, which he created when he was in his 20s. One of his greatest works, a fairly early work by Michelangelo. And uh, what's different about this statue? Well, a lot of things, but for one thing, if you look during the Middle Ages, you will not see any statues of nude human beings, right? There's none of that in the Middle Ages. Why? Because the human body was seen as a source of shame and lust. It was one of the things of this world that the church didn't want you thinking about, right? Um, and therefore, it wasn't considered important to make the human body hyper-realistic, anatomically correct. Uh, instead, in fact, the human body should be covered with heavy cloaks. It should be kind of hidden, right? So when you, for example, if you see statues from the Middle Ages, they're usually statues of saints or biblical figures or popes or whatever, and they're always wearing heavy robes, right? But Michelangelo and other Renaissance artists said, no, the human body is a beautiful thing. Therefore, we should try to, we should study anatomy so that we can really get it right. And we should, 
we should uh, show it in all of its naked glory. We should not, we should not cover it up. Right? Um, and obviously, this statue is modeled on the kinds of statues that we see all over the place in ancient Greece and Rome. In ancient Greece and Rome, nude statues were just were, were common. And this is a, a deliberate sort of imitation or an homage, you might say, to that style. Now, it is a biblical subject, though, right? It's David. And it's actually David at the moment just before he hits Goliath in the head with that rock from his sling. He's got the sling over, the sh over his shoulder. He's got the rock in one hand. And it's this moment just before he springs into action and lets loose with the rock. Okay. Notice also an interesting comparison between medieval style and... Uh, Renaissance style, the same subject matter. Here we have a medieval depiction of Mary and baby Jesus, okay? And I realize this isn't, you know, ideal, but you can find this painting in your textbook. Uh, then we have the same exact subject matter, Mary and baby Jesus by Raphael. Huge difference, right? For one thing, in the older medieval depiction, the features don't look all that natural or realistic. The proportions of baby Jesus, for example. Notice he doesn't really look like a baby. The proportions are all wrong. Babies have big heads and pudgy bodies. Jesus here looks like a little shrunken man. Why? Well, because after all, Jesus was the king of kings. Uh, he was, he was God-made flesh. It would be considered kind of undignified to make him look like a realistic human baby. What's more important about Jesus is what he represents. So we're going to make him look like a, a king, maybe a shrunken king, a little king, but like a king nonetheless. Notice, by the way, also, although there's, there's a lot of detail in this painting, like the three-dimensional attempt, the attempt at 3D perspective in that chair is not very successful because they didn't really, they had lost the ability to do it in a mathematically correct way. That ability was, uh, was rediscovered by painters in the Renaissance like Michelangelo and Raphael. So here's Raphael. Notice how baby Jesus now... His, he's practically naked. He's got that, he's very realistically depicted. He has those baby-like proportions. He has that cute, chubby baby flesh that you just want to pinch or blow bubbles into, right? And he looks like a real baby, right? Um, and, and, and notice also, very sophisticated, uh, even though there's, there's nothing in the background, just the use of light and shade makes this look convincingly 3D. Right? It looks realistic. Right? And we can even tell where the light is coming from. The light must be coming from here somewhere to reflect in that way on Jesus' leg and on Mary's forehead. Right? Tremendous attention to detail, not in just the human form, but in the way that we see things, in the way that light reflects off of things, in the way that, that shadow and light help to produce uh, the... Uh, the 3D effect, which in this case, of course, is an illusion because it's a two-dimensional painting, but Raphael is going to great pains to make it realistic, to make it true to nature. Right. Okay, so all of this is, it, 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 you can see how it ties in with this new attitude of humanism. The human body is a beautiful thing, not a shameful thing. It's important to get things realistic, really the way they are in nature, because nature, although it is a thing of this world, it's beautiful, and it is worthy of our attention and our study and all of that. Right. By the way, the, the humanists, again, they were Christians, and they had a Christian rationale for this attitude. For example, the idea that human beings all have inherent dignity and worth, something the Catholic Church would kind of poo-poo or roll their eyes at. The humanists would say, well, remember... All human beings are made in God's image. We are made in God's image. Therefore, we must have, uh, we must have individual worth and dignity. God made us. Right? 
And, and nature, for example, who made nature? God. Therefore, it's sort of, it's infused with the divine essence or whatever. It's not just something to be, to, to be ignored and that you go through life with kind of blinders on, thinking only of the world to come, right? Um, now, I haven't even gotten to one of the, again, one of the most important parts of the Renaissance, and that is the Reformation. The Reformation, of course, is this rebellion, ultimately, against the Catholic Church, led by Martin Luther and eventually taken up by others for their own reasons, like John Calvin and Henry VIII in England. The Reformation, of course, is this breakaway from the Catholic Church, initially led by Luther, uh, and, and, by the way, Luther greatly aided by the printing press. Luther was a prolific writer. He believed that every individual should sort of, should come to know God in, in a sort of a personal relationship, and that meant reading the Bible for yourself, not relying on some priest to act as a middleman, to tell you what the Bible says and therefore what you should do. Right? And this is, this is again, a new idea. It's an idea that obviously resonated with a lot of people. And, of course, keep in mind, Martin Luther did not set out initially to rebel against the church, to break away from the church. He himself was a Catholic monk, a priest. He wanted to reform the church. The church did not want to be reformed. And ultimately, of course, there was a break. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole subject of the Reformation, but the Reformation is, is a natural outgrowth of the Renaissance. The the, the Protestant faith of Luther was much more humanistic, right? It's that human beings can come to know God on their own without the intervention of a priest. That's why there are no Lutheran priests. There are Lutheran ministers, but there are no Lutheran priests. Right? Um, remember also, the Catholic Church didn't want people reading the Bible on their own didn't want the Bible being translated into vernacular languages. But this is one of the first things that Luther did when he broke away from the Catholic Church. He translated the Bible into German, and he had it printed so that people could read it for themselves, make up their own minds, right, find their own path, whatever, and not be so uh, enthralled to the Catholic Church, right? Um, so, what Luther began, others took up, again, Calvin, Henry VIII, for his own reasons in England, and pretty soon, much of Northern Europe was no longer under the umbrella of the Catholic Church. So, the Catholic Church gets weakened even more by the Reformation. Now, the, the Catholic Church does try to sort of fight back, and the, 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 the Church's attempt to sort of fight back against the Reformation is called the Counter-Reformation. And we'll learn a little bit about that when we talk about the music of Palestrina, who was a uh, sort of the leading composer of the late Renaissance uh, Counter-Reformation era. Uh, he was a sort of a court composer to the Pope in Rome, uh, Palestrina was. We'll talk about him in a bit. But uh, the, the book makes this point when they say, toward the bottom of page 65, the Catholic Church was far less powerful during the Renaissance than it had been during the Middle Ages. For the unity of Christendom, that is the Christian world, the unity of the Christian world was exploded by the Protestant Reformation led by Martin Luther. No longer did the Church monopolize learning and literacy. Aristocrats and upper middle class now concerned, uh, considered education a status symbol, and they hired scholars to teach their children. The invention of printing with movable type around 1450 accelerated the spread of learning. Before 1450, books were rare and extremely expensive because they were copied out by hand. But by 1500, 15 million to 20 million copies of 40,000 different editions had been printed in Europe, so an explosion. Right. So, um, I've, I, I, I'm, I'm already a little bit over time. I like to keep these lectures at no more than 50 minutes, but this subject is just so big and so fascinating. Uh, the subject of the Renaissance and the transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Now, I haven't even gotten yet into 
music of the Renaissance. So I will do that next time. Next time I'm going to start to talk about music in the Renaissance, characteristics of music generally. And then from there I will talk about secular music and sacred music. Actually, I'll probably talk about sacred music first. But this division, this categorization into sacred and secular is still valid and is still important as we move into the Renaissance, right? So we'll still be using that kind of categorization. We will talk about the differences between music of the Renaissance and music of the Middle Ages. Maybe a little bit about some of the similarities as well, because there are similarities as well as major differences. Right? So tune in next time for a discussion of the general characteristics of music in the Renaissance. See you then.